if Maury had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. Here America's first. Here it goes. Blah, blah, blah. The blah, blah, blah. Sending out good vibes. Blah, blah, blah. Good vibes. Blah, blah, blah. Good vibes. Sending blah, blah, blah. Good vibes. And there's this Ojibwe guy, medicine man, big, you know, big time leader of his, of his, of his nation. And he's telling the filthiest jokes I've ever heard in my life. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grand America Show. We're going to be chatting to the one and only Carl Joseph DeMarco a little bit later. Of course, we had him on the show before talking about China Weird a little while back. Um, I forget the number. We'll figure it out. It'll be in the show notes. Maybe Graham can figure that out before I introduce him. Probably not, though. Um, of course, we came to talk about his new book, which is all based on the work of, uh, a lot of it's based on the work of the one and only Joseph P. Farrell, who's been on the show a couple of times as well. And the book was called, what was the book called again? <laughs> the, Egypt. Uh, yeah, no. <clears throat> it was about... Uh, the Giza Project yeah, revisited. Yeah, Giza Death Star Restored. Giza... Death Star Restored. And we wrote the foreword. We should know the title of the book. Yeah. Good one, buddy. Yeah. It was yeah. mostly me. Yeah. He was nice enough to give us the foreword. Yeah. Absolutely. And of course, big shout out to our buddy, Bill, friend of the show, Bill, who uh, gussied it up for us and made it readable. And uh, yeah, buy the book. You should enjoy the interview. Carl's friend of the show. He's a great guy. We always have a lot of fun whenever we chat to him. And without further ado, I give you the one and only... Graham, dead air, Dunlop. How's it going, buddy? Not bad. It's all this live, like, going live thing, and we have to make small talk and chit-chat, and I'm just not used to it, dude. You're just not used to it. It'll be good for you. Do you want to just jump in and explain? Well, actually, first of all, I want to say thanks to Carl. And, Big thanks, uh, Carl. Yeah. Yeah, it's always an interesting chat. I liked. I really did like his book. Like, it was one of those, like, honestly, we've had a few guests on. I feel like I've, I've said all this before. Maybe I said it on the show. Maybe but we've had a few guests on that have written these like fantastic sort of semi fiction. I mean, it's truly a fiction, but based on conspiracies and facts and stuff that actually could end up being true in the next couple of decades. And it's just, I don't know. We're good. Good it ways to true. weave that tale and include all the kind of stuff we talk about on the show from ancient mysteries to spiritual stuff, shamanism, fiction, high based technology, on globalism, the cabal. I mean, it's got all that stuff in it. Great. It's a real page turner. It I is. Thought, anyway. Yeah. Make a great movie. You even pass it on to some friends to read. Yeah. That, that's, that means a lot when you. It means a lot. Yeah. I'm glad. Glad to hear you say that. So anyways, you want to jump into the stuff, a little housekeeping right off the bat then? What kind of housekeeping? Well, first we do a little intro before Looks the show. Like you're losing some weight. Talk. I have been. Yeah. You can skip ahead, hit the skip button yeah. or go to the timestamp in the show notes if you don't want to listen to our bullshit. A lot of people say they force a few intros in though and they fall in love with the intro. So, hey. Maybe it's worth it's fucking power. It's an acquired taste. Your, you're an acquired taste. Especially <clears throat> you. That's no, probably more me. So you know when you change your, like, do a legitimate change in diet or physical activity, and then I get this sore throat right away, and I come down with, like, a little, I don't know what, what it is. What was your change in diet and activity? What do you mean? Why are you looking at me with that uh, smirk? <laughs> I'm just, well, I'm just... Stopped eating those fucking sandwiches in the morning. Off the sandwiches, not the sandwiches day. and the pizza. Like no sandwiches and pizza. You've been Basically on, the bread, bread. You've been no on the bread Richard stuff. Parker again. I've been on the Richard Parker diet. <laughs> Just eating meat. There's your problem. <laughs> What's the Richard the Parker bread? diet? Eating humans. Eating dick. <laughs> uh, <laughs> dick Parker. Yeah. I feel uh, that was strong. Came from being lost in a boat with people named Richard Parker. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh. It devolves quickly around here. Yeah. That's good. You're just off, uh, what do, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, it's kind of gluten, kind of carbs. I mean, it's just one of carbs, those things, right? Carbs. And you just stopped eating the Sugar chips. Sugar helps, and... too. Sugar's Sugar, I still so put honey. Good. Like, I'm not f- full keto or anything like that. I don't, maybe one day, I but I just honey. don't. I put honey in the coffee. That's going to be a hard one for honey me. Right so. my mouth. Oh, come on. I do. Like, so anyways, so why... Why does it happen then, you know? So now, I don't know, I haven't really been exercising because I've got this sore throat and it, now it's turned into like a little tickle in Maybe the chest sometimes. Sick. And 
I know, but why after I make this change? And then I thought maybe it was the moldy jerky I had because right. I had the moldy jerky before the last show, before we recorded the last show. And, and then I fine. went home that Wednesday night and I woke up in the middle of the night with a tickle in my throat. Like I could feel all of a sudden instantly something wrong really? with my throat. You know what I did? I went and got a uh, gluten-free no, no, burger yeah. and order a cactus cup At potatoes. like 11, 11 o'clock? Yeah. Yeah. Fucking piled it down and went straight to bed and yeah. woke up just feeling like a bag of shit. Really? Yeah. Even though there was no gluten in there or anything like that? Yeah, I think still, it's because just because late night eating, like, yeah, right and then just bed. go right to bed. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the other thing, just try not to snack at night. But I've been hungry, right? It's it's. I don't think my body's adjusted to it yet, and I've been pretty hungry and starving. And I've just been trying to get some cardio and they do some legit exercising and then... Starving Marvin. Yeah. I'd like to slim down a little bit you need more the next carbs, couple of months, maybe. like maybe 15 pounds Eat some total. potatoes. 10, 15 pounds, maybe 20. Try eating some potatoes. No, oh, that's carbs. Whatever. We'll eat. Stay off the gluten, get on the carbs. No, I'm trying to get off the carbs. Are you on like wild rice or brown rice? No, I'm not on, I'm just meat and veggies for the most part. Bacon and eggs, meat and veggies. Try some brown rice. A couple gluten-free pancakes. Eat gluten-free pancakes? Yeah. What did you use? Or you just bought some processed gluten-free pancakes or you made? No, it's Kinetic brand. It's the best Kinnick. gluten-free pancakes ever. ever. They're better than normal wow. pancakes. Isn't that something? Yeah. There you have it. I can make a pretty mean gluten, gluten-free gluten pancake myself. Yeah. Use a mixture of almond and coconut flour. Really? Eh? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So fuck you. Actually, you know what? I had, uh, we had a gluten-free cake for the birthday party the other day. Oh, it was fucking primo. It was good, eh? Yeah. Soft, too. Mm. I didn't know you could make a cake that soft without real flour. Wow. The more you know. Good stuff. So what do you got? Well, I, uh, no, so we wanted to talk, do you want to talk about the what? website and the live show website, and stuff? What or we, what, I can't remember what you... on the website, yeah. Oh, I thought you were... I thought when we were talking it's earlier coming. about what we're going to talk about on the intro. We'll have a new website soon. We'll probably roll out some changes. Roll out some changes. And then we're, we've sort of, do you want to talk about the live thing? Change that? Well, I mean, there's not much to the live thing yet, but we did grab a URL and stuff. So we do have like a stream going at all times. The URL is not friendly for me to just fucking say. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. No, but, but we're working on some it, places. Right? But yeah, we'll have a nice pretty link for it eventually. And, um, We've we've talked to some other shows like OBDM, our big dumb mouth, I think, our big dumb dumb mouth, damn mouth, dumb mouth, dumb, dumb. Um, they're gonna do their live stuff on there. Cruise Mistake is gonna do their live stuff on there. Uh, John Brisson's gonna do something on Sundays, so it's quickly gonna fill up with some some live shows. And then when it's things aren't live, it's just gonna sort of play a constant um, loop of everyone's back catalogs, and we're not gonna bother monetizing it or anything no like it's that. just gonna, gonna be a it's kind of gonna be like a marketing just thing go. a way, it's more really. of just a thing to market everybody yeah yeah and it's you know and we're going live anyways nowadays on yeah, youtube no, but now we can do and yeah. stuff like this i'd rather go live on my We'd, own network yeah exactly rather put a couple bucks a month into that instead of speaker yep no i mean experience. i don't know what we got on on speaker like uh, what uh, what our numbers were like on there compared to other stuff but well, it no, wasn't really helping this was see no and it was like fucking 25 bucks us a month or something like yeah. that so this one's close to like 70 bucks us a month or 80 bucks us a month yeah but that's 24 7 it seems to work i can do the stream at 128 so it doesn't sound all tinny and shitty like a lot of you know yeah so uh, yeah i think it's a good thing and of course we should give it there's our buddy over at fringe fm joe roop that uh Drug us into the deep end of the pool pretty quick. Happened yeah. fast. Yeah. Pow, pow, pow. He's going to be our big sister station over there at the Fringe FM. Yeah. So uh, Fringe FM and Grand America FM. Yeah. Under K Fuck or something like that. K Fuck you. And um, <laughs> yeah. So check that out. Like I said, we could do FCUK. The link will be, be good too. FCUK? Yeah. FC, FCUK. Maybe it's available. We'll see. Anyway. Check it out. We'll pop, you'll put the link in the show notes for the live stream. It'll be on the new website. I don't know when that's launching, but it's coming sooner than later. Probably the next two weeks, I would guess. How about T. Ruth? T. Ruth? Yeah. What would that be like? T-R-U? T-H? That's too many. I think it's like four. Truth? It has to start with a K. Truth? <laughs> 
T root. It has to start with a K. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> um. Okay. So yeah, that's kind of what's new around here. Of course, we couldn't do any of that stuff if it wasn't for the people that do support the show. Um, over gra- at grimerica.ca slash support. We really do appreciate that. We can't run this motherfucker without you. And of course, with all the, uh, like Graham was talking about last week, with all the censorship and stuff like that that's happening, it's a scary time. So, you know, <clears throat> you know, it's time for us to start, you know, start maybe seriously considering investing in our own infrastructure and being able to self-host and things like that and not being... I've heard that we're on a pretty reliable host for the website, so we don't really have to worry about that. But, you know, it'd be nice to start hosting all our own audio files and stuff like that so that we're not beholden to anybody should they decide that they don't like what we're talking about down the road. And that kind of stuff costs money. So without our supporters, we couldn't even think about stuff like that. Of course, we're not there yet, but we could get there one day. Yeah, yeah. We can dream. Yeah. Head over to grammarica.ca slash support today, guys, and sign up for one of those. There's weeklies, there's monthlies, there's yearlies, there's Patreon, PayPal. It all helps. Yeah, there's ways in the show notes as well to support the show by emailing us or uh, reviewing it. Absolutely. Uh, a bunch of other things. And then uh, we do you do get access to the Black Budget feed, which is some different types of content. Um, we put out a show or two a month in there. I'm releasing, what's it called this yeah. week? The talk from the buddy from Portland. Yeah. And like we, what we said about Portland. Oh, yeah. We haven't put that out yet. I'm going to put it out tonight yeah. or tomorrow. Maybe probably tomorrow. Okay. Mm. Before this show comes yeah. out, though. Okay. So if you're hearing this on the podcast and it's already out. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about it, Portland and it. homelessness and drug use and drug addiction and recovery. And uh, home, yeah, it was, it was a good chat. With one of the guys that heard our feedback about uh, our Portland show and when we came back from close to there, when we went to the cabin and he emailed us and we had him on, so... There you have it. There okay. you have it. So what do you want to talk about? Do you have a rant? No, I got a Twitter feedback. Well, there's a Twitter rant. Is that okay. a rant, that one? You didn't sure, even read it, I don't think. He, just sent it. I just he sends it to me. He sends it, sends it to me to... This is the of the brain. What the... What is this, a new jingle? Old jingle I found. But if it's not your rant, it's no good. This is a Twitter rant. I think this was in response to the tweet that I asked, that I said support was down and that we needed some support. And she said, that's because you guys are fucking alt-right Fox. No. No, I, no, no. I didn't read it. I sent it to you. That's your department. Hmm. Yeah, and I've, uh, I've uh, lost it all of a sudden here. That's okay. Yeah. Like you were saying, the support links and all that is always in the show notes, along with everything else. Everything that you could ever need to know about the show, it's in the show notes. <clears throat> everything that you could ever need to know about the show, it's in the show notes. So go on over to America.ca or GrimeAmerica.com. Yep, that's it. Hi, in broad strokes, I started listening to paranormal and conspiracy podcasts in 2004. I was looking for intelligent, fun, and distraction in that flavor of thinking outside the box. Right away, I noticed the U.S. based shows smelled off. Mostly a lot of infighting between hosts. Also, having worked in the media and government, plus my ex is an art director in advertising in New York. Can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Speaking of infighting between hosts, fuck you, OBDM. <laughs> it is, we're going to, we're going to, I think we're going to cut each other up on the live stream a little bit. That'll yeah. be fun. That'll be, yeah. Probably just turn into three of us picking on you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it is disappointing to hear people without professional experience talk about how things work. Yes, wealthy people get together and talk about ways to consolidate their wealth and power no, they probably don't all have temples to demons in their basements. Actually, those type of conversations came later. I believe the first wave of U.S.-based podcasts were very heavy in talking about a mix of UFOs and messages from Ascended Masters when they were not arguing with each other. I ended up finding the first iterations of MU and Red Ice 
and you went off the air, then came back with a new co-host and a disturbing, to me, format where the second story is always ultimately about scary military tech presented in a jokey way. Did you realize that? I haven't listened in a while. I'd have to go back. Yeah, I, uh, me too. I think I've got, Actually, like got a, 10 gigs worth of stuff in my app. Yeah. But I don't, that, that's an interesting pattern that uh, I do remember a bunch of those, you know, scary military tech stories, but, you know, it's super ham fisted, obviously propaganda and unlistenable. Red Ice also required a handler of sorts with Henrik's wife, and we all know what happened there. I have appointments today, so I promise to pick this back up tonight. I think I can pinpoint where things started going pear-shaped, where so some wait, of the current never, wait, very wait, effective messaging never, <laughs> into the culture started. I've never heard... Uh, yes, you have. ...about MU being propaganda. It's the first time I've heard really? MU being shills. Wow. Rogan, yes. But not. So is he saying Aaron's kind of from the, you know, that, that sort of cop, ex-cop scientific community? Aaron was, yeah, I don't know Aaron's background. That's why he unfollowed you way back when. He blocked me. He blocked you. (laughs) So fuck him. So anyways. Just kidding. We love you over at MU. Ben's a sweetheart. So he says, I think I can point where things started going pear-shaped where some of the current very effective messaging into the culture started. There's a lot of details. As with the MU example, you don't have to be an expert in psychology or counterintelligence to spot planted ideas designed to influence folks. I wonder hilarious. if that's why Ben came back then, because... Because he was getting fucking paid. You know what's interesting is that, that never had that synchronicity with the teacher from the UFO course, and I thought about him, and I was like... Thinking back to that course and that teacher specifically, and it had been years and years and years. I think Ben listens to the show though. So and I was in a weird. I was in a stop weird. Point, not me. I was in a weird Starbucks. Just because you stick make it all your fingers <laughs> in a Starbucks, like away from where I, I normally am. Yeah. Two days later, and I saw the teacher in there. You remember me telling you the story? Yeah. Is that his regular Starbucks? No, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> No, I don't think so. Anyway, it doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. I was thinking about the guy two years before. I hadn't seen him in decades. And then I bump into him. I could hardly recognize You're him. You're thinking about two years teacher. before or two days ago? Two days. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. And then I start that, talking you know to him. He looks is. at me like I'm crazy, kind of. And he's like, hey, well, he wasn't into it. He wasn't into me saying, hey, I remember you talked about UFOs in the 90s. Oh, that's my thing. That's and a then, ripple stick. And then... Uh, <clears throat> And then he's you like, well, him. I'm, not, I'm so I was asking him if he's still into it. Like I was interested to have this conversation again. Cause I was, I left the subject for a while too. And I was back, but I think he was out. He just says, all I listen to, I only listen to Benjamin Grundy. BG. And that's how I found him. You. That it. Oh, so this was 10 years ago. Yeah. Huh? Crazy. eh? <laughs> that is pretty crazy. But we talked about this already. I can't re-rate it. No, but but it's if interesting. I rate it yeah, but now I, it's different than the last rating if, I gave you. Then oh my credit! I'm not. I don't want a rating. I'm just asking. I'm just saying. It's interesting now to think back and say I never even came close to thinking Ben would be a shill and and spreading propagandic ideas. What if people think we're shills? But I don't know. Sometimes Some I think on. you're a shill. I'm doing a pretty good job, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Role playing RPG <laughs> in the shill. <laughs> uh. Continue. When I talk about trips I've taken, you're like, oh, I didn't know you're that world uh, yeah. tra- well, well traveled. Maybe you're the handler. <laughs> playing the playing the dumb believer. That's okay. Works. Like I was saying. But I mean, imagine like 10 years ago thinking that. 10 years ago? No way I was thinking about anything close to that. So it says, if whatever is an is an offer serves to hurt if whatever is on offer serves to hurt people is cruel, petty, or dangerous, it's probably directed propaganda. Sometimes the cruelty or danger is under a veneer of jokes or something seemingly logical because din- disinformation can ha- hide in plain sight. So, usually, if you think through the ideas a few steps, you get to a place where the only idea works of large populations suffer. That's the test I use. If you think the idea is a few steps, 
you get to a place where the idea only works if, I think he means, if large populations suffer. So the current rhetoric that every single person in government, now I don't understand where he gets this from. So maybe, he's just, I don't know if he's talking about our show specifically or general. Yeah, I'm listening. <clears throat> I don't know why they don't, what, this all was in response to an excuse for not supporting. The current rhetoric that every single person in government and corporate life is evil and corrupt is simply not true. Oh. So I don't know. I, I don't think we I think spells he, that rhetoric that all the, I mean, geez, I know people in the government and in uh, corporate life. I mean, I came in from Canada, corporate it's life. like one in every three people works for the government. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know where, I don't know. I don't see that rhetoric. Maybe it's out there. Let's get so, the whole full round of it before. Okay. Do, yes. Cause, the, Cause she actually, or she or he, what's her name? I, I forget. I they messaged me. They don't say. Jessica must be a guy. I just thought must I, be a girl. I, oh. So she tweeted today and asked what we if we was going to respond. Oh, I said we'd address it on the show. Oh, awesome. So yes, the system is broken. Yes, people are compromised. Sure, the idea that the rule of law and voting, some form of democratic government, doesn't work only serves the interest of global organized criminal criminal in, yeah criminal endeavors and directly equals increased suffering and oppression. That's what the Trump slash Brexit narratives are selling if you peek beneath the hood, that the rule of law and democracy don't work. That's what we're saying? Say this, that again. That's what For the real. Trump slash Brexit narratives are selling if you peek beneath, peek beneath the hood, that the rule of law and democracy don't work. I don't agree with that, but continue. I know. I don't know. I honestly don't know where that comes from. It seems like it's the other way around, to be honest with you. Continue. I have so much more, including legislation and rule changes going back to the mid 80s and 90s that got us where all this, where we are going today. Again, wealthy, powerful people do work together to consolidate money and power. Important laws that kept a check on power and influence have been rolled back or are no longer enforced. That doesn't make Pizzagate real. It makes greed real. I really have to go now. I hope that wasn't so broad that is dismissible in your minds. I do have specifics. I just have an appointment this morning. I wasn't expecting to respond when you did. Anyway, let me know if you want to hear more. Cheers. Oh, damn. Racism. I can't believe I forgot that part. Wait, wait. Can I play it? That's not working now. It's broken. Because I forgot. Go ahead. Just, just fuck it. <sighs> so, <clears throat> so when I... Oh. What the fuck is that? Bingo, bingo, Why'd you play that jingle right now? You're just cutting right out of this? <laughs> this is kind of a social media jingle. Okay, it's from Twitter. Okay. It's from Twitter. Okay. okay. So when I mentioned the test for messages being the suffering of others, racism, racism is a place where goals behind the likely curated ideas on conspiracy theory and suffering intersect. If you are familiar with the coded language racism uses, and I urge you to listen to at least the first 20 minutes of a few eps of the pod Save the People with the Ray McKesson to understand better, then it's easy to think through the narratives common right now on conspiracy theory podcast a few steps and see how they often really talking about racism. That's you, buddy. Ideas that are ultimately racist turn off the audience. Click there on to another content. And I'll bring up the N-word here, Nazism. Most of us have parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents that fought against the Nazis. We studied the build-up to World War II in elementary school and high school. People see all of this as a slippery slope that's going too far. We are horrified. I love the Michael Fe Freely episode. At the end, Graham starts talking about Trump, hence my tweet. Guys, this isn't innocent. Trump doesn't represent anything positive. It's not fun believing that he's fighting against corruption and or the deep state. Yes, there is corruption on both sides of U.S. politics. Yes, the U.S. military is an empire, and many citizens are not aware of this. Yes. No, what's going on right now is not the cavalry to the rescue. 
a saying literally born of military propaganda from earlier U.S. history. This whole thing going on is tragic. How can I convince you this isn't fun thought exercise? Instead, it's a dangerous and toxic ideas that are not congruent with your values towards yourselves and others, question mark. I mean, I, I don't really get it. No. It's not really, but no, I mean, I, I just, I just really don't. Yeah, I just don't. I just, I just, don't, did to I just a couple, a couple of the I mean, examples. I know well, no, we didn't come, outright. we didn't become unlistenable. I don't think that's yeah, saying they, that at yeah, all. Yeah, 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 she had stopped listening. No. Oh, to, really? Yeah. Okay, I thought she was sort of generally saying that. And then generally saying why, yeah. pe- why we're losing support. But that's okay. If we have to lose support like this because we we address some U.S. politics without really being on one side or the other, then that's, so be it. I mean, we're pretty that's alright. Like, we're not a fucking alright. I'm, I'm nothing. Not, no, I'm, I'm nothing. Not. Oh we my god. Together, I bring you back down. We. You're fucking. Oh, we, you're eh? on tilt, buddy. You're no out of way. control. So out of control. But anyways, a couple of the examples so here. Are we Nazis? Are we support? Is Trump a Nazi? Are we making light of Nazis because we're not the no, ones? No, Nazis has nothing to do with us or the show. Okay, I don't think. I don't. I'm not really. I don't understand where that and the Nazism thing comes from. To be honest with you. Okay. But calling people Nazis when they're not is not fun. Talking about not fun. So where's that? Like where, so I, this is what I don't understand. Where is the condescending aspect of that side calling everybody that's white or a Trump supporter or a Nazi? That is happening to, from a lot of people. Where's that call, calling out that? I so know. I don't understand a couple of parts on this. I don't understand where <sighs> Brexit is against law, the rule of law and dem- democracy. <laughs> when they're trying to get out of the EU that is actually not voted in. It's a bunch of lifetime politicians that are, that are fucking promoted to that spot, not from voting. So getting away from that, you want uh, no law and no democracy. I I really don't get it. It feels all backwards to me. Well, you're going to have to resend us something. And you don't have any comments on that. You don't want to say, I can't, I don't have much to say. It's hard. It's kind of all over the place. It's not really concise. I don't understand. I mean, it's obviously about your, again, it comes down to like Marsman or whatever his fucking name is. It's again addressing, they, it comes like it's this issue, this bigger issue. And then when you drill down into the bottom of the email, it comes down to some sort of fucking politics. Yeah. And I just, you know, it, as soon as it gets political at the end, then all of it is you know, I throw the whole, unfortunately, I throw the baby out the bathwater because I'm sick of hearing about it. I don't want to hear, I don't think we're political on the show. You're a little alt-righty, but, uh, you know, we don't talk politics on the show, so I'm sick of, I mean, unless it was in we'll, the back But I, but I would we criticize were pretty, fucking we were Trump and everybody. Trump, we we're going to cri- pretty trump supporty back in the day, but. Whatever. Well, we'll criticize them. We'll criticize everybody. Yeah, fuck them. It's not, I mean, I mean we look at we've had John, John on. We talk, we're trashing them the whole time. Yeah, so, I, you know, I... Much to grin. Obviously, Graham should grin. But the the problem the problem here is saying that uh, because laws that kept a check on power and influence have been rolled back, that doesn't make Pizzagate real. Like, what the fuck does that have to do with Pizzagate? Are you? Were you? I think you're a Pizzagate supporter. Um, yeah, there's something oh, yeah. there. Yeah, more Paddlegate yeah. would be the appropriate term. Pizzagate was a distraction. There it is. Yeah. That's you don't think there's a fucking they, thing going on there? I don't know. Yeah, see? Could be. When it gets to the third rail, you don't want to talk about it. That's right. I don't want to get... You don't want to get banned off YouTube? I don't want to get kicked out Censored? of Fuck them. Anyways, thanks for the... Do you think the pizza gate was real? Feedback? What? Do you think the pizza gate was real? Pizza gate was a... I just said, pizza gate mm-hmm. was a distraction. Pedo gate is real. From the pedo gate? Yeah. Podesta's the pedo gate guy? Podesta oh, pedo? Photo oh my pedo. God, no. Come on. <laughs> 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 no, you're just making fun of the whole thing. I'm not. It's a serious subject. This is why people Talk stop listening. What's that? <laughs> people <kidding>. stop. <laughs> What's that? Anyway, I got some more feedback here. We got uh, from the Facebook page. Hey guys, just wanted to let you know that I love the show. Your topics are diverse and really informative. I also love the chats before the show and find them to be equally interesting and funny as fuck sometimes. 
Just answering the recent question on Facebook about what the show needs more of. Nothing, to be honest. A suggestion might be the possibility of a connection between the supernatural, ghosts and hauntings, to people's energy, like their vibe at the time of the experience. I myself have had quite a few experiences, but looking back at them in my recent journey into my own and our consciousness makes me think that I caused the elect- electrical, electrical, and other things that happened myself. Eclectic? No. Electrical. Eclectical? Could have been the eclectic. That's what he meant, I think. It's the eclectical and other things that happened myself as at those times I was going through some stuff. Anyway, just a thought. Maybe interesting. I haven't gone through all of your shows as of yet, so if this has been covered, I would appreciate if you could point me to the episode. Great show again. Can't say a bad thing about it, but I do, and I do plan to contribute in some way soon. Nice. Thanks. Yeah. I get some more feedback too, some interesting stuff from emails. Here's we got some feedback, some more feedback. The show needs more international flavor, maybe from the South Pacific Rim, maybe Central Asia. Needs less dirtbags not giving contribution and stealing the show. Hmm. Uh, nothing bugs me about your show, and I'm glad I found it about two years ago. It kept me sane working a crazy shift. Shortly after I found you guys, your witty banter, Darren trying to bust Graham's chops on certain things, it just flows well. Okay, you can go ahead. But I'm not going to go to the YouTube today. No, oh, stay away from the me. troll central there. Trolls are fun sometimes, though. You know, I was just thinking, hey, we talk about, you know, being of love on the show so much and hey. working on ourselves, all this positive stuff. And you mentioned fucking Trump one time and people think you're fucking all He's, right. You, are you mentioned right. one positive thing about somebody on the other side. I mean, it's unbelievable. <laughs> 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 so it's, it's, it's fucking incredible to me. It is. Yeah. Like. You get passionate. Yeah. You're passionate. Yeah. I like it. Some hope and freedom, maybe, you know? Freedom against the fucking globalist that. tentacles that have been dragging us down. Yeah, See, that's, that's not, a, no, that's, that's, See, that's, no, that's getting yeah. carried away. See? We're not that's getting, a, no, we're getting no, dropped we lose a bunch of support, Yeah, that's right? it. Then we just lost a bunch more support. But look what's happening. We're losing supporters because of your fucking Nazism. What's happening, Canada? All our money's going fucking elsewhere. Can't even feed our homeless. Drug addiction. Things are, things need to be ha- helped here. Right? Right. <laughs> no, you, know. you could have just stopped that. Like, I appreciate two your, I appreciate your, uh, I perfect. appreciate your disconnection from it. I do. If you would have just stopped was at like last two October, sentences yeah. earlier, it would have been perfect. Okay. All right. You just got a little okay. carried away at the other, but I agree with you. I do. But, yeah. I'm going to hear about that. Okay. Anyway, hey, I got this person no, wrong. I got to support in the show. I got support go up. I got to pass the future. Past the, past the future email here. Past the future. Yeah. Like pasta. Do you ever wonder what it was like in the beginning? Like spaghetti? No, of Gramerica. Pa- past the future. Hello again, Mr. Graham. Yet again, I write you from Is this Mars your man? past to my oh, future. Okay. I'm still hooked on your show and I still listen to a couple episodes a day when I'm at work. How about, I'm now at about episode 175. And so far, I get the feeling that you two are just the same two guys that started the show. Still humble, still funny, better, but better sounding with better studio and equipment. You got more confidence throughout the episodes and the interview stays. Interesting, though all not subjects speak directly to me, of course. I really like the intros where you just rant on each other and talk about random things. It really makes the show personal and your guests get that, which makes the interview flow naturally Which question uh, with questions going both ways. I'm going to donate, show my appreciation, but wanted to know if you guys still offer T-shirts in the, in the near future. <laughs> No. How much to get a t-shirt to Little Denmark. You just got to go on to grimeamerica.ca slash swag. But on the new website, the store will be fully integrated into the website. Slash swag, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this, the, the Redbubble store will be integrated into the website? Yes. Okay, cool. I was going to talk to you about that. I'm so integrate my fist into your face. Also, I want to tell you that your show really opened my eyes to all the weird things going on in this world, especially synchros. That happens to me more and more. Friday the 13th of July, I woke up and thought about an ex-colleague of mine who I know was about to be a daddy like within a couple of weeks. I got up and wrote him a text saying, hey, bro, are you a daddy yet? He wrote back almost immediately saying, yeah, the water just broke and they were on the way to the hospital. How did you know? That freaked me out a little bit. 
But that sixth sense of mine has been awoken from listening to your show. That plus some breathing exercise I learned from you really put more colors to my world. Last, I want to know if you guys have seen the new Netflix movie called Extinction with Michael Pina. It puts some focus on the human versus AI thing. I have not. I'm not sure this is not the last. Oh, I'm sure this is not the last email you get from me, but for now, I must end. Keep up the good work. Best regards, Stevens. P.S. I'm on the save Sasquatch side. Darren? Sorry, Darren. That's okay. Yeah. So uh, what did I want to say about that? Oh, geez, my sister had a crazy synchro the other day. Should I try and... Should I try and say it? I'm a rambling gram with synchronicities all over the web. And Darren is skeptical about everyone and don't believe it yet. Okay, this is... <clears throat> huh. let's hear it so she's at this conference and the lady's being asked some questions i'm going to really skip this i don't know like I, I wish i could i i ask her to write these things down and send them to me and she won't do it and i know she probably won't listen to the show so i can just rag on her a little bit then i have to try and describe but she has she's got this psychic thing man it happens all the time so she's she's at this uh conference and the lady's being asked about her favorite tv shows as a kid and the lady's having a hard time answering the the show and my sister goes back and thinks about home and away you ever heard of that it's an no. australian soap opera no <laughs> far and away maybe it's called far and away i don't no. even know what it's called i'm not up to date. and she was totally I don't think like, i've ever even seen she was a... totally she was totally thinking about oh man she used to love this far and away home this this, this Australian soul proper, she used to watch it as a kid and she was starting to think about it quite a bit. And then she woke up the next morning and she got this, somebody connected with her on LinkedIn and it was one of the guy that works on that show. And like, if you ask the normal person, they wouldn't even know what, what that show is. Like that's super rare. I think an Australian. No, I've never heard of it. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That is pretty crazy. She's like, what is going on? She gets this message from LinkedIn, and it's this guy that works on the show. I'll give her a 7.7. Yeah. And there was a double. It was a, there was another one that happened to my camera. That's a higher that. score than yeah. you'll ever get. Than I'll ever get? Probably. I would say. Don't you think? Yep. I don't think you'll get a higher score than that. Oh, I, well, I would have. You would. I would have. I accumulated all the ones that happened to me all the time. This is an accumulation thing now. We're adding them up. The other day I walked up the stairs looking at this crystal ball that I have on there. And I was like, that's going to fall off soon. And I walk up and I hear bunk. And I didn't see it move. It just fell right after I thought it was going to fall. Just, that's because you willed it off. No, I, I, that doesn't work. I tried as a kid. It just doesn't work. You should be doing it wrong. You accidentally mind. do it right. It's like, you know, a thing where you can move your tongue and like, Gleek or whatever they used to call it, where you spray out of your little, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. They, yeah. I could never do it, but I could do it accidentally. Yeah, my friend used to do that all the time. So you're you're just, just a little, you're, little spray with water Your psychic powers just work accidentally. Yeah. Like your orbs. Yeah, there, was control another, there was another one that happened that, that, like right after that, there was two little ones like that where I looked at that thing and I go, I bet you that's going to fall soon. And then it came down and it fell like right as I got up to the top of the stairs. You're psychic. Like girl. I was probably shaking the stair, you know, I was probably shaking the thing running up the stairs. They're pretty heavy. Yeah. A heavy set, dude. Yeah. Low center Beef gravity. Beefcake, they call it. Beefcake. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> Just go back to that one. <laughs> Clutching at straws. Get out a pen and paper and write this down. Or a pencil. Why don't you send some physical mail to the Grimerica Show? At P.O. Box 16033. Next line. Uh-huh. 100-815, comma, 17th Avenue, SW. Next line. Uh-huh. Calgary, Alberta. Next line. Uh-huh. Canada. Next line. Uh-huh. T2T, space, 5H7. That's the P.O. Box. Why don't you send Darren some dirty socks? Cause he's got a dirty sock fetish. Uh-huh. Why don't you send Graham some gold bowling? Cause he's got a gold bowling fetish. So we got this mystery package. Oh yeah, P in the P.O. Box, yeah. Air mail from hope, Ireland. The return of justice oh. says QWERTY, Q-W-E-R-T-E-E dot com. Do you think they just sent us a shirt so we'd mention them on the show? No, I don't think so. One shirt, 10 pounds shipping. 
It's sent to the Debla. It's sent to the Great America show. Oh, did something pop out of it too? There's no letter. There's a melted as fuck candy. Oh, they got an Irish candy with it? Is it alcoholic? That's pretty bad. The Sorry. first three ingredients are glucose, syrup, and sugar. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just a melted mess. And the shirt. It's called a, uh, the Haribu. Star Mix Minis. All right, eh? Did you use it? see the share? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh my God, that's awesome. Oh, my God, it's a, it's a holy grail thing made as, like, Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs. <laughs> hieroglyphs. Oh, that's awesome. That is the best shirt ever. It's got the enchanter in there. Okay, and you the, can have the, it, buddy. Yeah, thanks, dude. I'm going to wear it next show. It's got to be for, for you sure. and this fucking shitty melted candy it's must be large, for me. It's a large, That looks like a big large, though. Those are large. They come from, they come big in there. So the is it the guy who makes the QWERTY? I don't understand who sent us this. I don't know either. So it was either an anonymous uh, sender or just a QWERTY. But they, how'd sells? they get the candy in there? I don't know. They just put the candy Does in. Does QWERTY give candy with every t-shirt? I don't know. Melted candy? Look at the carbs on that. 77 <laughs> grams per 100 grams. <laughs> 77. I guess I can't eat that. 23% less carbs. So thanks for the... I can smell it. Can you smell the candy? It's coming out of the package or something. Open it up. That's the o shirt. Open it? Oh, fuck. I was giving my mom shit for that. While I, was oh, we're here. <laughs> I heard her say it. Oh. I was like, you fucked me. <laughs> <laughs> Open open okay i got the ufo quote and then we can wrap this thing up oh i didn't know we were still doing that i thought oh, I, I do have another I, I do have something i can leave it for next time but i have a, an article from the guardian i'll nah, leave that? it for next time okay I'll just do it. your quote is this the last ufo quote before we start no doing it's not the last if you if you let me do more than one then maybe we can get to the end Graham, going do deep. two then really okay i gotta look it's for a the second no, we'll just do one. no no i'll find it quickly i'll find it quickly chance. I, no, I'll find it quickly. No way you're finding it. Words to ponder and critique. It's a profound UFO quote of the week. Much evidence tells us UFOs have been tracked by radar, so UFOs are real, and they may come from outer space. That was from General Kanshi Ishikawa, Commander Chief of Air Staff of Japan's Air Self Defense Force, 1967. Interesting. Yeah, good one, eh? You got another one? Better hurry up. Yeah, I can find another one. Cut you down. Here. My throat's really sore here. Oh, that's what she said. I have been asked about UFOs, and I've said publicly I thought they were somebody else, some other civilization. That was Commander Eugene Cernan, commanded. The Apollo 17 mission, quote from a 1973 article in the Los Angeles Times. Nice. Eugene, more like you seen. You seen <laughs> UFO. All right, guys. Thanks for sticking with us for our lazy ramblings during this intro. Um, nice listening. So like I say, like we always say, support the show if you can. Check out everything in the show notes. Do everything and grab show notes. Support the show if you can. Most of all, enjoy this chat. Carl Joseph DeMarco friend of the show author all around good guy and you motherfuckers can have some good vibes for your weekend where's the good vibes thanks jingle? buddy <laughs> hmm. pretty quick on the jingles today i can't find the good vibes i think that you should get those obdm guys to show you how to jingle fuck you <laughs> i just shut off your mic <laughs> what you to say now? Huh? what's that <laughs> You're out, Dunlop. <laughs> Dead air, Dunlop, for a reason. Good vibes. Good vibes. Under need breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection. And put on a didgeridoo and shit. All right, do we got to say, uh, oh, are we still on here? How we do this?
morning, gentlemen. First question. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got Carl Joseph DeMarco back in the studio. Well, he's not physically in the studio. But he was on talking about his uh, book from China Weird. We had him on, I don't know, probably a couple of years ago now. And he's was written... Last year. Was it last year only? Was, yeah. Wasn't it, wasn't it last year? I think that book came out in March uh, 2017 or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, okay. So, yeah, about a year, a year and a bit. And, uh, yeah, yeah, so you've got a new book out. It's a different different type of book. It's like Number a... Number 217. Sort of a, a fiction based on some crazy conspiracy facts and stuff like that. Based on Joseph Farrell's work, The Giza Death Star Restored. We both read it. It was awesome. Actually, you even allowed us to do a foreword for it. I gotta, I gotta add this. So the intro we just recorded, that the email that you went back yeah, in time and read was from March 28th, yeah. something like that. <laughs> well, Carl's episode came out on April 1st, 2017. Oh, wow. There you go. A little bit of a synchronicity yeah. to start us off. Yeah. So thanks for coming back on to talk about it. And really, it was an awesome book, Carl. We loved it. 217 was one of the well, favorite episodes, too. I'm glad you enjoyed it. You know, we should also mention uh, Napoleon, the guy who does your artwork, because he also did the cover illustration for the book. And I want to thank oh. both of you for turning me on to him and also Napoleon for doing such a great job on the illustration. All right. Yeah, that's a good point. So this is kind of like a Grimerica project, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. yeah, we had a small part. Yeah, it was it was a great book. I found. Yeah, I, you even passed it on to friends and stuff too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, a, yeah, it was a good one. So, uh, wow. So uh, your friends liked it too. Yeah. Well, I gave it to the one buddy who who helped. Uh, he kind of helps clean up some of my writing. So. <laughs> I don't we should have actually any money, give us. Here's a great book for you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It I've was. Done that. It was fucking. Yeah, it was a good book, man. It was one of the. I don't read a lot of novels, but it was like it, it had such a twist on, you know, all the themes that we follow here, and it has some Indians in it. So yeah, I was all in, man. Indians, Nazis, and and ancient technology, shamanism, yeah. a- ancient technology. Yeah, I There's love some these doobies in there. I love these types of books where it's kind of like it takes you through this there's a possibility that some of this stuff is true. And even when you get into the, you start off by getting in the deep state stuff. And then you're like, man, if that is true, but you know, you've heard the conspiracy rumors before and then you wonder, and then, you know, it takes you all the way through. You know, we've had a couple other guests on too, that have, that have created these types of books. And they're, they're my favorite. I think they're not my new favorite type of novel is the ones that are sort of based on conspiracy facts or conspiracy possibilities, and then get into some, some real stuff as well. So, yeah, it was really good. Well, Dr. Farrell talks about that, too, doesn't he? And, and uh, I guess some of the, the middle books, uh, what would that be? Um, after... Uh, the Fourth Right. Not after yeah. SS Brotherhood of the Bell, but a little later than... Uh, maybe it starts with The Philosopher's Stone, The uh, Quest for Deep Physics, something like that. And he talks about how there was a post-war Nazi writer that wrote a lot of so-called science fiction, but he would preface these books with, in this book is hidden actual reality or something like that, right? Yeah. And he says you can learn a lot about what was going on in the uh, Nazi post-war scene by reading this guy's books. So uh, it wouldn't be the first time historical fiction is used to explore these ideas. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. I forgot. I totally forgot about the whole start of it there. Yeah. And that's like, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's all fun stuff because well, I'm, we're going into a big, not, like I want to go down the Nazi rabbit hole here sometime and, and I'd like to do a couple episodes on that. We should get Joseph on and do an episode just on Nazis. Because yeah, he could take you a lot further down that rabbit hole so than I can. Are you talking about post World War II Nazis yeah. or go all the way back even further? No, po- I like post World War II. I think is good enough. Like with the, what is, uh, I mean, he's been on your show a couple times, hasn't he? What did he talk about? One time we did Antarctica and some Nazi stuff, and kind of I can't remember where else we went. We, we ended were up, UFO deep state nine eleven. He was really the yeah. one that articulated the different layers of the 9-11 conspiracy, you know, kind of made me think about it in a oh. different way, you know. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Well, yeah. We could do a straight Nazi show yeah, for sure, sure because I think there's a lot to that, especially like, oh, yeah, the museum stuff, going to the museum in Iraq and all that stuff, you know, kind of uh, what was funny to me is when I was when I was reading it, it kind of triggered in my head that they say, hey, maybe Trump is a Nazi. <laughs> 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 Well, he wouldn't be the first in the White House, would he? <laughs> Doesn't seem like it. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, all those things you guys just mentioned are are dealt with in the book, too. You know, uh, Dr. Farrell, I think, is the most important nonfiction writer alive today. The kind of things that he's revealing in those books are so well-researched and supported and documented, I mean, what would you expect from an Oxford scholar, right? Uh, just just exactly that, that it, it leaves you with the shuddering possibility that, that this guy is onto something. Even if he's not 100% correct, he certainly got the big picture down, you know? And I thought, what would happen? Like, you know, if, if everything he's saying is real, what's a story that would take place? Uh, amidst this reality, you know, for people who were hip to it, you know, maybe, maybe something that's going on right now that we don't know about. And that's uh, kind of what launched me. I never really expected to write a novel, but I was sure that I could not match his nonfiction work. And there's a lot of heavy physics and math in some of it. So I thought, you know, maybe a, a novel would, would make this accessible to people and, and see, you know how it how it could how it could play out. What's the logical consequence if everything goes wrong? You know. So well, and I like the peek. Like. Yeah, and then the peek into the deep state, like the 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 back room, like the smoking man style thing, where these guys are really trying to plan the destruction or plan that the uh, the whole the whole event was pretty cool as well because it really did take you from that that uh, the thing Darren was just talking about, like in the Iraq museum and all that. And then it takes you to, you know, it really gets you, it gives you that feeling that there might be this, this group of people that are actually on to shit like this. Yeah. It takes you into their secret lair and San Carlos de Bariloche and the, uh, the Dulce base, you know, uh, which are popular, uh, let's say tourist attractions for conspiracy theorists, right? All of these things uh, play vividly in the imagination and it would just be interesting to put them all together into a single narrative instead of always viewing them in isolation in, in this book or that book, you know? So do you think, would you be, could you give us like a little couple minutes sort of rundown of the book to for just to kind of get, you know, everyone in the vibe? Uh, well, I don't know if we'll get everyone to buy it, but a uh, quick rundown would be that it, it's based on the uh, first three. I guess uh, Dr. Farrell would say four because he did put, I think, uh, Reich of the Black Sun as the technically the third book. But he wrote the Giza Death Star series, which is three books, four if you count Reich of the Black Sun. There's the Giza Death Star, the Giza, the Giza Death Star Deployed, and the Giza Death Star Destroyed. And it's a fascinating trilogy. I did not start reading his books from the beginning, uh, as he recommends with the Giza Death Star. I started like near the end, I think, with uh, The Third Way, which is a book about the Nazi international, and that was mind-blowing enough. But after I read a couple, I thought, well, I got to go back to the beginning and read these in order and see if that makes a difference. So I got through the Giza Death Star destroyed, and I was like, well, what about the Giza Death Star rebuilt or something like that, right? Uh, isn't, isn't it possible for someone to do that? And that's when the idea for the story first started circulating, but I didn't think I had enough for a novel yet because those are really science-based books where he delves deeply into the physics and the lost history behind them. And I needed something more modern that I was more familiar with to make a narrative. So I kept reading through the books. I think I've gotten through about 15 of them now. And the Nazi stuff is what really brings it all into the modern world, especially his book on 9-11. 
I mean, that's something that people can really reach out and touch for themselves, you know? And then I started to get an idea of how, in a modern narrative, these pieces could come together. But one thing I remember Woody Allen saying is never write about something you don't know. So I had to draw from personal experience and characters I know in real life to put the book together. And I remember both you guys and Tim Banal had a lot more questions about the tracker school stuff and my contacts with the Navajos out West uh, that uh, kind of went into the world of woo-woo a little bit. So I thought, you know, well, I, I could bring that in and then, you know, I'd be kind of writing about myself and my friends in a way. So I could do that. And I blended the narratives into this single story where Dr. Farrell finds out that the Nazis are trying to restart the Giza Death Star. They have the technology. They've done the archaeology. They've recovered the ancient texts. They have machines that can reproduce the parts that were destroyed. And now it's up to him to stop them because every agency in the government has been too compromised. They would never be able to pull it off. And he calls on this private a uh, circle of people he knows to assist him. And uh, there's a character based on one of my instructors at Tractor, Tractor School who kind of operates this uh, altruistic and uh, philanthropic band of, uh, uh, of mercenaries that, that love this kind of stuff. <laughs> and these other two characters, one of them is based on my best friend from tracker school and he uh, becomes a character that assists them. He's in this, this other guy's uh, little private circle of philanthropic uh, mercenaries. And they go from one challenge to the next uh, trying to stop these Nazis. And it, and it kind of shows how the deep state works behind the scenes as well through these bogus charitable organizations and NGOs and, how they orchestrate world events, and they're doing this in such a manner as to directly combat opposition as well as move forward their goals. And Farrell has to stay one step ahead of them, and he's not always he's not always there. He's playing catch up ball sometimes with his with his crew, and it comes to a tumultuous climax on the Giza Plateau at the pyramid itself, where. You know, the Nazis have started it up and they're causing earthquakes all over the world. And uh, that this private group of mercenaries is trying to get in there to turn the damn thing off before they destroy the planet. It brings world leaders together to launch these joint military expeditions to take over the Giza Plateau. And the whole thing just comes to this big crescendo right there where it all started millions of years ago. So that was it. I guess it was kind of a personal fantasy, too, to insert a character somewhat based on myself into the story, you know? Yeah, but it's also based on, there's also a lot of other cool things. Like, I think you had the portal thing in there, too, which the governments were kind of, you know, there's peeps about that as well now, that there's people investigating portals, you know, that are in the know and the government. And and I think there was the pyramid stuff based on Dunn's work as well? The pyramid stuff was uh, based on the work of uh, four people. There's Farrell, Dunn, Kunkel, and uh, I think the fourth guy was named Cadman. And I think it was Kunkel and Cadman who figured out it could have been powered by water. Right. Ooh. And, and the Nile I, used I to run a lot close to there too, yeah. right? Yeah, it, it did. And so they could, you know, get the water up there to, to power it. And I think they had a reservoir that's dried up since also that was above the pyramid. And that shot so, the shit out of the planet that used to be between here and Mars. <laughs> that's right. Uh, no, between Boom. Mars and Jupiter. Between Mars and Jupiter, yeah. And that, that's, in, uh, that's dealt with, too. Uh, that, um, Farrell mentions that while trying to explain this stuff to some of the less knowledgeable characters in the book and he you know and he says something like uh you know the asteroid belt well that used to be a planet you know or something like that and uh so and there's a lot of easter eggs in the book too you know i've been so indoctrinated by (laughs) popular culture that there are these easter eggs throughout the book lines taken from movies and 
TV shows and things like that. And in some cases, I reveal the Easter egg, but in other cases, I leave it to the reader to recognize that line. You know, there's uh, one part of the book where uh, somebody said, where, where Thorny says, uh, it's all in the reflexes, you know, so people who are big fans of the movie that came from would, would recognize that. And I think a lot of people in conspiracy circles uh, would be familiar with most of the movies I am. There's stuff from Repo Man, Big Trouble in Little China, <laughs> Casablanca, uh, all kinds of stuff, you know. Hogan's Heroes is in there somewhere. So I, I put all these little pieces in there that uh, just out of fun because I can't help it. And uh, that would make the book enjoyable for a lot of culture vultures, too, just to uncover those things. Most of those would have went right by me. <laughs> but I think Thorny uh, spent well, some time hotboxing a cave. <laughs> so I can relate to that. Uh, that's true. But uh, I did pick, like... Uh, uh, alternative history and science uh, flashpoints. Uh, there's a couple you mentioned. There was the Stargate that's supposedly in the ancient city of Ur. I think you're talking about portals. Uh, there's the pyramid itself. There's the Nazi International. There's 9-11. Uh, I think there's some discussion of the Kennedy assassination. One of the Nazis, I think uh, Richter, the chief physicist, puts together a PowerPoint presentation to show their corporate uh, suck-ups, you know, what the plan is and what their role is in it. And he explains this whole sordid history of how they've worked behind the scenes and put companies together and how they're trying to rebuild IG Farben uh, to be like the corporate overlord for the world and things like this, you know, and the methods they use through big pharma and pop culture to seduce and seduce people and numb their minds. So that's another hot point for uh, conspiracy theorists. And uh, the, the CIA drug running is another one that makes it in there. Uh, the Dulcie base, uh, all, all these hot topics uh, find their way into the narrative. Oh yeah, that there's the whole spin on the economic takeover of the world after World War II. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a really that's still part of the. Um, um, still part of that Nazi mystery, man. We really got to do an episode on all that. You could put like eight episodes, yeah. ten episodes, just out of the book. <laughs> I'd listen. Uh. Well, I was just about to say something when you, you, you reminded me of something there, the whole uh, Nazi corporate takeover reminded me of another point, and now it escapes me, darn it. Uh, I can't remember. So, anyway, well, what, uh, what's your next question? Well, what, what motivated you to do this? I mean, I know you, you kind of were thinking, I mean, you mentioned it a little bit about about Joseph Farrell's work and sort of putting it into a, a fiction. I mean, is it just something that popped in or were you, was were you thinking about it for a while? Uh, well, I was pretty inspired by the work and to be honest with you, the story started writing itself in my own, in my own mind, in a way, or my own imagination. Um, you know, a lot of times authors will start with the end of a book and then write backwards to just get to that end or they'll outline it or something like that. And I, didn't do any of that, man. I, I was just so inspired. This voice started speaking to me and I would listen to it. And the story came out really exactly from first word to the last in that order. Uh, and, you know, I guess I had to kind of like go back and rephrase things in places and stuff like that. But uh, I, I never once had to map out uh, a strategy for getting the story out. And I think that's partly due to the spirit that Farrell imbues his work with. You know, he's, very, he's a very devoted man to the divine. And I, I think that comes out in his work. But also just the stirring of my own spirit that the, the book provided for, the, his books provided for me. 
You know, it was a, it was a very great awakening, you could say. I was kind of going to ask you about that, about if there's any spiritual practice involved in the writing, because we hear some authors that almost have downloads, you know, books get created within a week or two. We've had a couple of people on or people have important things happen in their life before they all of a sudden, you know, just write a book real quick kind of thing. Or, and you know, and I mean, you hear about writer's block and stuff like that and people that take long, long time to do their books. I mean, do you feel like there was any kind of channeling involved or anything like that? Or, or were you in any kind of spiritual practice that helped like this whole thing flow? Well, you know, from, uh, I guess, our earlier interview and, and the other book that I have had spiritual practices in my life, I kind of let them run on their own, sort of on autopilot, if you will. I don't do too many specific practices anymore, like astral projection or meditation or anything like that. But I, I kind of feel like those things are going on all the time. I would hesitate to call it channeling, though, mm -hmm. but... It was, uh, I would call it more of like a, a vision, you oh. know, and I, I think the vision arose, uh, at least I'm aware of two reasons of why it arose. One is for me to integrate the work into myself, um, the work of the book, Farrell's works, the new knowledge, the, the new consciousness that awakened from reading the books, and also to make uh, Farrell's work accessible to a new audience who doesn't like nonfiction or who can't handle the, the deep physics and chemistry that he gets into in, in some of his books. This kind of puts it in a more palatable form for, for them. And, you know, um, when you have a spiritual vision, it's never only just for you. There's always some greater good attached to it that you might not be aware of at the time, but usually these things are to benefit others as well as yourself, you know, otherwise that, that awakening or that integration would be merely selfish. And that's kind of the opposite message of the book. So, you know, that, that's why I think it came about. Yeah, that's well, I would of, like to say that that was my idea, but it wasn't. It just really forced itself on me. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at. You're probably open to open well, to that influence. I wonder if that's the same as channeling. Vision, yeah, I don't know. See, that, but I don't channel. know enough of. Chan I, I, yeah, I don't know if it's. Uh, I've done vision quests, so I can speak from that perspective. But I can't speak from the point of view of channeling. You guys might know more about it than me and make a better judgment. Not really. <laughs> No, we don't no, know. No, Darren's pretty. I mean, Darren's pretty skeptical of that. But I mean, it it might just be you're in a meditative state and you're allowing things to flow through you. But you know, we just had a, a sort of more of a deeper channeler on. We haven't released the episode. I mean, yet. I'd have and, more time for channeling if that's what it is. Yeah, Tap there's it probably into different you. levels of it or something. I mean, who knows? Yeah. Well, people could just come up with different names for the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know. Right. Yeah. So uh, some people would call it inspiration. Some would call it imagination. Some would call it channeling. Some would call it vision. I don't know. It could all, you could all be talking about the same thing and not even know it. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, a little while ago that we were both interested in the original show we did with you about your tracker school and all that. I mean, maybe we should, maybe you should get, get a little deeper into that and, and how you brought that into the book, because that was it. Now I'm, it's all coming back to me from that episode about, the trackers and the concentric circles and the, almost like the morphing into the, the animals and all that. Am I on the right track there for that? Um, yeah, you know, uh, one of the things that came to me while writing the book and it hit me, kind of slapped me, uh, suddenly was that, uh, these concentric rings, like rings on a ring. Now trackers use concentric rings in the wilderness or in the city to perceive changes and, and glean information. But it occurred to me that this is not unlike the ripples in the primordial nothing that uh, Dr. Farrell talks about that gave birth to the universe, the, the physical universe. Right. 
so I thought, you know, I'm going to carry this concentric ring theme throughout the book because this could be how the native peoples of North America or, you know, South America, shamanic civilizations all over the world, maybe this is how they accomplished great things. They were tapped into that power, but they kept it at a more primitive and natural level. They didn't need the technology to tap into it because they were tapped into it. And there's a couple points in the book where Thorny and One Flair interact with Dr. Farrell about that, where they say things to him like concentric rings, Doc, get it? And he's like, I get it. I get it. You know, <laughs> because he, he's the guy who's putting that message out there, but in another way. Right. So I, I think there's definitely a connection between how trackers and these uh, primitive societies use concentric rings in their daily lives and in their shamanic practices to the kind of science and high magic that Dr. Farrell talks about in alchemy that Dr. Farrell talks about in his books. You know, it's all torsion. It's all scalar. What are they? They're, they're rings, they're ripples. And I wanted to put that in there. And I even, asked Napoleon, you know, after he had done the original sketch, I said, can you add one thing? Can you add like ripples on a pond around the pyramid? And he put that in. And then when I saw his rendition of that, I was like, that's exactly it. And how does the, how did the pyramid work as an ancient weapon of mass destruction by using resonance waves, From right? Water. Harmonic, harmonic waves to wreak havoc and destruction. So it's, it's all there. You can use these rings as a creative and spiritual rebirthing process, or you can use these rings as a destructive and catastrophic uh, technology. Is, and so, is that what they were able to tap ahead. into when they were able to send the thought balloons? Uh, you know, I, <laughs> that's a good question. I, I did not think of that, but, uh, that, that might be how it works. I was taught that as like an isolated practice, you know, and we, we would do it in, uh, first learning it at tracker school. And then at, uh, later, you know, on the way home in rest areas or airports. And it, it, it definitely works. Yeah, and can you walk us through they, that process? Man, I'm like 15 years out of practice because I became such a, a spiritual Luddite during my time in China. But you need to imbue that bubble. First, you envision the bubble with all the passion you can muster. And then you put your message into that bubble with all the passion you can muster. I mean, if it's not important to you, it, you will not be successful with the practice. Okay? Okay. Because I, I remember doing it uh, in, in off days. And, oh, yeah, this is how you do it. Okay. Uh, uh, see, nothing happened. But then when something was, like, just absolutely urgent, you know, almost life and death, you'd make that bubble and you'd send it out and it would do something. And I remember the, the first time I did it, I was working with this Italian guy at tracker school, and I wanted to send him a bubble that would make him turn left, Right. So uh, he's walking down the trail. I, he doesn't know what I'm doing. He just knows I'm going to try to make some kind of bubble. So I send him this bubble, and he starts veering way off to the left. And he says, okay, I think your bubble was to make me turn off to the left. And I said, well, you don't have to exaggerate so much. And he's like, no, no, I couldn't help it. All right. So then he did the same thing to me, but his was to like, make me stop. So I'm walking along the trail and I don't know what I'm going to encounter. And all of a sudden I stopped and I looked around and then I kept going. And then I said, wait a minute, was your bubble to make me stop? And he was like, yeah, that's right. So, 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 you, don't, so you don't see the message. You just do it. I've never put like uh, informational stuff. I've only put like feelings or, um, motivations into bubbles. I've never like in the book, I have people actually putting messages to each other in the bubble. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah Cause yeah, I yeah. tried to say, send... I know that's, yeah, I know that's possible cause I've seen other people do it, but I have not been successful myself. 
I tried to send Graham a thought bubble to pack some stuff when we were on our, oh my God, on our yeah. cabin trip up last month, and he didn't do it. In fact, I well, I, was, I didn't even it wasn't even a thought in my mind. He even it looked even at like it. I was like, he he looked at it and about? assumed it was someone else's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes that is successful, though, you know, like, uh, oh, they already left and I forgot to tell them to bring the potato chips. And then they show up and they have potato chips. And you say, hey, how did you know to stop and get potato chips? And like, I don't know. I just had an idea we should get some. Yeah, but Darren wasn't uh, you know, he wasn't passionate enough at all. I mean, he was just, he was just like. You blaming me? Yeah. Maybe it's yeah, you. Yeah, well, listen to him. He never sounds passionate, does he? <laughs> You're you all know? fucking that's, glutened that's, that's up. Darren's thing. He, what? It's just super chill, man. Yeah, it was super. It was chill passion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> passion well, chill. Why don't you start with those bubbles, making people chill out, right? Yeah. Next time Graham gets angry, just like send him a chill bubble. It's hard in the summer. We keeps the door open. But, but I'll tell you. Uh, I was going to say now. Uh, I thought this was a bubble story, but it's not. It's a tracking story. So that's okay. I'll, that's I'll okay. Skip it. No, no, mention it. All right. Well, uh, since, since tracking plays a role in the book, you know, and I talk about counter tracking, there was a hilarious trick somebody played on a guy at tracker school. There's uh, one of the instructors there uh, used to bring an Aquafina bottle into his tent every night, right? And the reason he brought an Aquafina bottle is because the, the nozzle on the bottle is a lot bigger than other water bottles, right? Just like more normal water bottles are like a Coke bottle, right? Is it real oh small? Boy. Well, aquaf- I know where this is a wide going mouth. <laughs> Yeah, well, the guy would use it to pee in his tent at night so he wouldn't have to get up out of the tent. Well, one night before bedtime, somebody snuck over to his campground and cut the bottom out of his bottle, right? Cut a little hole in the bottom. <laughs> so... He gets up at night and he's like peeing into the bottle and he's like, this bottle's not getting any heavier, right? And it doesn't feel warm. And then he notices the sound of trickling water on the floor of his tank. And he gets all pissed off about it. Well, I get up one morning. Yeah, this is a bubble story. And I want to put on my sandals because it's a hot day, right? My sandals are right there where I'm sleeping. I say, yeah, I'm going to put these sandals on today because it's pretty hot. I don't want to wear running shoes, you know? And I'm like, no, no, I can't wear those sandals today. I'm going to see if I can find where I set my running shoes. And I walked up to the kitchen area and my running shoes were sitting there at the base of a tree. And there was like a glow around them, right? Right. I was like, oh, yeah, there they are. Why do they look bright this morning? The sun must be hitting them just so, right? And I put my running shoes on, and I start walking around the camp. It's the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, so you leave clear tracks everywhere you walk. Well, Eddie sees my tracks in the morning and figures I'm the guy who cut his (laughs) piss bottle. Okay? Now, uh, he doesn't say he thinks it's me, but... He's talking in the kitchen. He says, yeah, I see the tracks of the, sh- of the shoes of the guy who'd done it all over the kitchen here this morning. So I said, huh, that's interesting. Most tracks are mine right now because not many people are awake yet. So I uh, hoof over to his camp area, and I see two perfect footprints right next to each other with my shoes. Oh. Right? Now, I know I didn't do it, right? So somebody clearly put on my shoes to cut his piss bottle and then put bubbles around my sandals and my running shoes so I would choose one or the other in the morning to wear. So it was a double prank on both Eddie and me. So later that day, Tom Brown's leaving one of the lectures and walking past our work shed to go in his yurt. And he looks over at me and he says, that you who cut Eddie's piss bottle last night? And I said to him, I think it was you, because only you could set me up like that. (laughs) And then he just got this big shit-eating grin and took a puff on his Marlboro, (laughs) went into the yurt. (laughs) 
Nice. That's so crazy. yeah, that that is a that is a bubble story for sure. That's how I think he did it. Was so he put information in there, right? That's Not a just, good one. Uh, yeah. And so, it resonates with our crowd because Graham's a piss joke guy, and he uses the wide the mouth guy? bottles. Oh, he, he, really? You're yeah. an Aquafina guy, huh? No, no, Gatorade. The Gatorade is the, one of the bigger mouth on it. <laughs> yeah, less well, like this. Regular Coke. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I use a fucking ice cream pail. So what kind of track in school is that though? Is that like a shamanic track in school or like what it seems a bit not like your average uh you know I think it's right. Navajo, isn't well, it? No, it's Apache. Uh Tom was taught by a lip in Apache who he called grandfather and he once told me his name in Apache and I can't remember it. But um he he learned from the time he was like uh seven years old how to track and survive in the wilderness from this guy. And he got into the, he was taught the uh, Apache spirit songs and the uh, whole full of philosophical and spiritual tradition. And now he passes it on to anybody who will pay for a tracker class. And it's a lot of people. He had, by the time I got there, he'd already had something like 80,000 students go through the school. Wow. And there was, yeah. And, um, you know, I guess since he's a white guy, he's teaching mostly white people. But one of the characters in the book was an Apache Indian I met at tracker school. The the Daryl character is based on him. And um, he he came to a number of classes and would often help out when Tom did the West Coast courses. But, um, I, I haven't been there since 2001, so I really don't know what it's like there anymore. But I'll tell you, man, it was some of the best years of my life were spent going in and out of that place. And that was one of the most eye-opening and awakening times of my life. I mean, you know, uh, it was like, it was more mind-blowing than an acid trip. It was incredible, the stuff that, that, that we did and accomplished uh, with what Tom taught us. How long was it? Each class is a week. I took like 15 classes. I got Holy. some classes for free because I helped out a lot. And... Uh, I remember one uh, time I uh, showed up, I was dropping some people off at a class, his Way of the Coyote class in uh, 2000, I think. And I was just giving some people a ride there. <clears throat> and the guy who ran the kitchen came up to me and said, uh, hey, Thorny, I think you need one of these. And handed me a volunteer badge. So then suddenly I, I was there for the week. It turned out to be really uh, synchronistic. You know, I would say my life is full of synchronistic experiences. That was that was one of them, and that was a that was a mind blowing class too. And then Tom came into all the volunteers that week. They're called helpers, and said, "Okay, I need you helpers to form your own helper group. You can't be helping out too much during this class because you have too much to learn." And we ended up being in like in the majority of the lectures and all the outdoor exercises. So how, how much do you, like, that's got to be, that's almost three, that's three and a half months. How much do you, like, how much are you accessing that in your day-to-day? Because that's got to be some powerful stuff. Well, my wife complains about it sometimes. Like, she'll turn around and suddenly I'm standing there and she'll get angry at me for uh, walking so quietly. Or she's looking for something and can't find it. And I say, well, there it is. And I'll... She said, how did you see that? And I'll say something like the eye of the tracker or something, you know, some wisecraft. But uh, so, yeah, it seeps in. It but, seeps in. But there really is a knack to that. I remember I had a girlfriend in Nelson, B.C. once, right? And her dad was mm-hmm. like, right. one of, her dad was a hunter kind of guy, right? He was always right. hunting. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and he took me out sometimes and he would catch things moving in the woods and I couldn't even see them. And he'd be like, see that right over there? And it would take me like five minutes to find what he's looking at. And he would just, it would just be like a natural instinct for him to just pick up on stuff happening in the woods. It was, it was incredible seeing that. I'm very light on my feet wow. too. I wonder if that's because I'm half Indian. I'm always sneaking up on people. It could be. I mean, you know, your brain is hardwired for certain things based on, you know, where you come from. Genetically, so has to be, uh, right? Is that, that racist to say that? 
Are you being racist right uh, now? I'm being scientific, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's hardwired. Darren, you're hardwired to be light on your feet. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. <laughs> what else am I hardwired so, for? Uh, yeah. So, you know, that, that there could be something to that. I don't know. Maybe it's a tradition you want to pursue a little more. I should. Thoroughly. I should get into sneaking around, sneaking up on what's people. Your, what's your heritage, man? Uh, Jibway. Oh, well, gee, boy, that's Great Lakes area. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I was with an OG boy guy when he made it rain. Ooh, I should get into that. <laughs> 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 I we think were, we do uh, have rain dancing for sure. Part of the part of the story is set in the Holiday Inn in Gallup, right? And that's because I spent time there uh, working on a project with uh, the American Indians on substance abuse, right? The government was giving them grants to use their own methods to, to do that. And it was called the Rural, Remote, and Culturally Distinct Communities Program. And we were at one of these things. I remember the first day there, and I was new to the project. And the first day there, I come down for breakfast, and I got my tray of food from the buffet, and I look over at this table and there's all these pencil necks from Washington. Yes, and uh, so where did you get your master's degree? That's very interesting. And then I did my postdoc work at, I'm like, I'm not sitting over there. I hate those, that kind of talk, right? And then I see this table where like everybody's laughing hilariously. Like they're all laughing so hard they're pounding on the table, right? So I'm thinking, well, that looks like the place to be right there. So I walk over there and I said, you got room for one more? And they all, like, they pulled it. it was, the table was full. They all slid over and made room for another chair. And there's this Ojibwe guy, medicine man, big, you know, big-time leader of his, of, his, of his nation. And he's telling the filthiest jokes I've ever heard in my life, you know? He's the spiritual leader of the Ojibwe people in, in uh, Wisconsin, I think. And... We're just laughing and having this raucously good time, and it's all Indians except for me. And then, uh, you know, a couple of days, uh, they just built a relationship from there. And the next day, uh, the same guy called me over, the Ojibwe guy, and he said, you know something? You're the first white guy who ever wanted to sit with us. And I said, I I don't know about that. I, I just heard everybody laughing at your table and figured it was the best place to be. And he's like, I don't care what the reason is. You're the first white guy. And uh, we're going to do something special for you and your mom this week. My mom was at the conference, too. And uh, like uh, fourth day into the conference or whatever it was, it was during the Navajo Nation Fair. And the corn harvest was really bad because there was a drought, right? So they got some Navajo medicine men, this Ojibwe guy, a, a Tigua guy from Texas, and uh, uh, Hawaiian Kapuna, and uh, or I should, maybe I should say Kahuna. Or maybe the Kapuna was there, too. One's a man, one's a woman, their brother and sister. Maybe they both went. And, and this uh, Lakota woman. And we started, uh, they said, they came up to us and said, you two aren't working today. We're taking you out to the desert to show you something. And we piled into this van and we drove, started driving into the res and uh, picked up this old woman who couldn't speak any English. She only spoke Navajo. And uh, they had to ask me to take off my sunglasses because they scared her. You know, she was really, really traditional and very old. I had to take off my sunglasses in the desert. And then they dropped her off somewhere and kept going and they got off the pavement and they're driving way out in the desert, like, you know how you see in cartoons, like these bleached skeletons of animals in the desert? That's where they were driving through. You know, you could actually see, like, dead horses and donkeys and stuff out there. We ever think of, like, holy so fuck, <laughs> these guys are going to yeah, kill me? Right. Yeah, they've never <laughs> been this far out in the desert before, right? So they finally stopped at this... Uh, rock that looked kind of like a frog and the Navajo guys started telling us this story about how the fro- the rock used to be a frog and the frog turned into a rock and made some promise to the Navajos that whenever they needed rain, they can come and ask him to make it rain for them. And they did this ceremony there and we watched it 
and we offered tobacco, the whole thing. And then uh, the Tigua guy, I think it was the one, he was the big joker in the crowd. He said, like, come on, let's get out of here fast. And they started tearing. I mean, they were like just, you know, blowing up dust on the way to the uh, get back on pavement. And just as we hit that road, man, this huge front moved in. It was black and just poured down rain. And then they were saying, yeah, we just saved the corn harvest for the Navajo Nation. <laughs> and when we got back to the fair, the sky cleared up, the rain was gone, and we just had a great time at the Navajo Nation Fair. Did you pick but up the old lady? The no, no, the old lady, I guess, wherever we dropped her off, she stayed. Huh. It was really it was like her house good. or something. Yeah. I'm wondering if she's, I'm thinking she did it. Yeah. You think the old lady was the one who did it? Yeah, well, that's how you. Whole, that's yeah, that's kind of where I was focusing rock. the whole time. Yeah, she, they didn't yeah. want to let you onto the real secret, so they took you to the frog <laughs> rock. <laughs> we'll take the white guy to the frog <laughs> rock. Yeah, that was the side show, right? Mm, that's an awesome story, though. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, so I I I think there's some truth to the stories you hear about these uh, secret Indian powers. You know, they have some way of doing it, and. That's why I wanted to get the concentric rings into the book because there's a lot more to that mystery than just tracking. Hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Darren, there you go. That's a good one. You can learn to make rain and make concentric circles. And I made sure to include in the book stuff people could do on their own to experiment with this stuff, you know? What's the easiest one? The easiest one uh, probably is uh, to just go sit quietly in the woods and observe the concentric rings moving around you. You know, if the birds come real close to you, everything's normal. If the birds suddenly react, you know, if you don't move and the birds are suddenly reacting some way, you know, something is happening. There's a predator of some kind moving through the area. That's, you could do that very easily, and not, not far from your home, probably, if you live someplace like Canada. You know, you guys are way up there. There's probably some wooded spot you can go to and do that every morning. Yep. I'll be out in the woods this Saturday night. I'll keep an ear out as well as an eye out. <laughs> I find the birds yeah. here get yeah, louder yeah. when the cats go out back. Oh, really? Oh, exactly. Yeah. See? Yeah. That's a, yep. That's, that's a concentric ring right there. Okay, you got to walk me through yeah. that. You don't even need to see the cat. When you hear the birds making a certain sound, you know the cat is there. Uh, yes, I agree with that 100%. That's a concentric ring. Isn't that okay. just brain? They can, be subtle, they can be subtler than that. You know, things can suddenly go silent. Or the birds might all fly down from the treetops. So what, you know? is a subtle ring bigger like it is, is it based on ring size so it's like a crazy synchronicity would be a tighter ring than uh me hearing the knowing the cats out back because of the birds like i can even tell if the cat killed a bird because there's a different trope for that right exactly yes i i wouldn't say subtler ones are bigger they're all the they're all the same you just have to learn the language and they all travel through the forest for some distance so that's where the concentric ring comes from, that, that it's sort of like a radius, like where the cat is, it's, there's a radius of activity or a change in activity? That's, yes, yes, that's and the that? peak activity is at the center of the ring. So someone who's really skillful at this could be, say, uh, two or 300 yards from where the cat is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. So it's like know, uh, throwing a rock in the lake, basically. Exactly. Exactly. And you can see, feel that somebody ripple. somebody on the other side of the lake knows that somebody just threw a rock in it because they see the ripples on the pond. So if you get good at sensing these things, then you could sense another sort of predator yeah, in another area and the rings tough. are overlapping and you could sort of sense where the safe spot is that's not within the rings or whatever. Huh. Right. Oh, that's... And I have to confess, I never really got quite that good at it, but I, I know it works. Yeah, no, I could see that for sure. <clears throat> Huh. Graham would be a big, sloppy, crunchy ring, I bet. No, we used to sneak around this probably put up a bird plow. No, yeah. we used to be pretty good yeah. at sneaking around <laughs> these kids. <laughs> you, were a lot, you were a lot nimbler then. 
<laughs> a little less huscular. Yeah. So maybe we so, should maybe well, we should uh, keep going. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say somebody you know once uh, told me that if you write a book, uh, it doesn't really matter whether it's fiction or nonfiction, and you dazzle people with all this uh, woo woo, but you give them nothing practical then that, that they can do. That it, it's really nothing more than a book of black magic because you're not helping people. You're just dazzling them, right? And if you want to make a book that is that will legitimately help people and uh, uh, how do you put it, uh, be a more spiritual uh, work of light, then you have to put practical things that people can do for themselves in there so that they can awaken them, their own consciousness, not just be amazed by what other people do. That's a really good point. Yeah, and also dropping deep state conspiracies in there that are based on interesting little tidbits, like the the whole... Oh, Iraq the, the sacking of the Baghdad that. Museum. Yeah, like it's it's like, like, I was going, like, I was searching for the articles on that. I could tell that it was really... I could tell that you had thrown some, some, some times and some dates, some facts in there on that, too, that make it really interesting. There's some real gems. Yeah. So, I mean, even if it gets people thinking that those are possibilities, even, is, is Possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, those, uh, if, I've, if I've given dates of historical events in there, then they're all true and they're researched. Actually, I'll tell you what, even the earthquakes are real earthquakes. You can go to an earthquake site and find them, the dates and the times and the locations. And uh, it kind of corresponded exactly with, it, it, was, it was bizarre. You know, when I first wrote the book, I thought it would end in 2017. But when I was doing the research on the earthquakes, I found like the exact dates I needed for a 2014 end of the book. And so oh. I, I used that instead. Yeah. So there's like two earthquakes in Panama and one in Indonesia. And you can look that up. They were, those were real earthquakes. Nice. Yeah. You know, good. but that just makes the narrative tauter, you know, that, you know, people who want to dismiss the book lightly and say, oh, this is all just bullshit. And then they can get online and research this stuff and see, no, this stuff really happened. You know, even the deep state stuff that Graham just mentioned, you can, you can document their activity. You know, it often pops up as some little article on page seven, man, but it's there, you know, and you just have to know how to interpret it. And Farrell is brilliant at that stuff. You know, I wonder if he's a spook. (laughs) <laughs> you think him and Dan at Dark Journalist over there are just uh, messing with our minds? Well, no, yeah, I don't. Think I don't so. think so. Too no, much. but it's fun to think about. Yeah, there's one thing in the book. I mean, I the, think, there's though, that like, Dr. Farrell would. What? Go ahead. There's so many. Like, how many books does he have now? Uh, I think it's up to like 28. Yeah, I don't understand how anybody can even write all those. And they're all like three or 400 pages. Yeah. That's like, man, I just went on this binge. I read nothing but feral until I got through like the 15th book. Now I have to take a break. I'm like reading lighter stuff now, but I'm going to get back to it. I want to get through all of them, you know, because I want to get the full picture of his hypothesis. You know, this book's this book would be great for that for anyone who's reading. You know, this is a this is a fun book. It's definitely not going to be a chore to read. You yeah. don't want to put it down. Yeah, and it, yeah, and it puts together the first half of his hypothesis into a cohesive narrative. That's all in one place. Huh. Why don't we mention? So, why don't we mention? Uh, well, when you're done there, why don't we mention China Weird for a bit as well, and some of your experiences in China just to. Because, I mean, you know, a lot of people might not have listened. We've got a lot of new listeners since we last had you on as well. All right. Well, we can do that now if you want. Um, you're, you're over an hour already, it looks like. Holy so, really? Yeah. 54 minutes. Yeah, we got, when you're having fun. yeah I got about yeah, 10, 15 minutes probably. We got to do a shroom session in the cabin together, gentlemen. <laughs> sure, man. <laughs> We can make that happen. I'm not going again. I'm not doing the chaperone thing again. No. You, guys are, you guys are on your own. I'm not doing it again. No. Well, come on. It's too painful last time. Well, I, it's just like, we'll bounce back. It's like hurting cats. <laughs> anyway, it's just, <clears throat> I'll just go in the woods and right. watch for concentric rings instead. 
listen for actually it. you could probably it. see them on oh, I, I mean, you could probably sense I could it on feel mushrooms them. pretty good yeah remember i could feel the that would be a good way to explain how i could feel buddy coming down the stairs that time when i was like i'm well, in you know, something i'm <laughs> under something well you know uh we were completely straight one night on a night tracking exercise and like the tracks were lighting up like uh like green lights like um like, like, uh, you know, those, uh, Phosphorescent? Sticks, you crack yeah. them and yeah. they glow green. I was seeing tracks. They look like that, man. Like no alcohol, no drugs, nothing. Just watching these tracks light up in the road in front of me. It was amazing, man. So Darren, you're on it. I'm on it next time. We'll do that. Now you yeah. have to come. Yeah. Now you're back okay. in. I wheeled them back in. <laughs> we got to do well, the yeah, cop circle this year too. A, I want to take the wife on the, the great American road trip. So maybe we can uh, swing through Canada. I got another friend up in your neck of the woods, I think from China. Um, he was in the China weird book. Actually, he was up all night. Stan, he lives maybe in Manitoba though, or Saskatchewan. You guys are in um, Alberta. Alberta, right? Yeah. We're pretty close yeah. to Saskatchewan. It's all pretty close. Yeah. I can be in Manitoba in 12 hours. Yeah, well, that's it's when you get to Ontario that it starts getting fucking crazy long and big, and you got to go around giant lakes and shit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But so, uh, yeah, I got a friend down there too. So uh, might have to go maybe east to west in the states and west to east in Canada. There you go. West to east is a lot more depressing than east to west. But that's probably the same in the oh, states too. So. <laughs> Well, I guess we'll just do a lot of eating at Tim Hortons. Oh, God. Yeah, you'd be stopping at the same three places yeah. all the way through. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> or truck stops. They're all flying J's. So, China. You got flying J up there? Really? Yeah. So, slowly, slowly, got a diesel slowly car, taking over. So, you know, I need a place that sells diesel to gas up. Yeah, that's every place here for sure. Okay. We drive a lot of diesel it's trucks hard to get up here. California. Do you? Cool. It's California. Never it's hard mind. To, yeah, California, man. It's, that's another. Uh, at some place I got to go because I got a lot of friends there, though. Go there now while you but can just, before you need a yeah, passport. Before you need a passport. <laughs> Last time I went down to California, I was like, we were only there for like 20 minutes. I was like, we're, get, we're getting out of here, man. We're going to go get your fucking fridge <laughs> magnet and we're getting the fuck back to Oregon. Where'd you, uh, where'd you go in California? Crack, just to Crescent City. The well, first that's not that bad a place, is it? That's no, like right I just mean California. Line. Yeah, exactly. It's perfect. Get back to Oregon. Uh -huh. And I seen like yeah. I swear I go down you're in California for half an hour and I seen fucking twenty cops. Really? Wow. Yeah. Big difference, eh? And then when you pull into California, they make you pull over just so they can check you out quick. Yeah. You have to you pull have over and they're like, stop, fruit. and they just kind of look at you and they're like, okay, keep going. That's weird. Really? That's yeah. Just, yeah. I've just finished fucking smoking a joint or something. I'm like, holy fuck, here we go. And then we just, just pull over and they're just like, go ahead. Yeah, but not when you're driving, I don't think. Last uh, time we got, we we pushed the limits last time for sure, but he let us go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, fucking Kyle almost Maybe, I don't know. Do you guys want to talk about China Weird a little bit? Sure. Um, Give us some highlights. Well, book, yeah, the highlights. Well, the book's in three parts. There's my own stories from China. Um, some uh, ghostly tales of hauntings that, that I experienced or some weird stuff that I saw. Um, then there are stories that the locals told, told me mostly friends that I'd made while I was over there. One of them had a really good UFO story uh, from about 1980 or 81 when she was taking the college entrance exam and these UFOs overflew the, the school. Um, and then there's the third part of the book, which is the legendary stuff that China's famous for. And I talk about things like uh, the Ye Ren, which is the Chinese Bigfoot, uh, talk about um, these uh, ancient civilizations that apparently recorded the presence of some high technology or, or alien race. Um, 
There are stories about lake monsters and Jiangshu, which are kind of a Chinese type of uh, undead uh, creature. Not exactly the same as a vampire. People usually call them Chinese vampires, but there's important technical differences. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, if they're real. Um, and I think I shed new light on the Ye Run story because I, I go pretty far back in the historic record for that. I think I go back like 3,000 years to unearth documentation of that. But it's also woven in with autobiographical stuff that makes it more interesting. So it becomes kind of a, a personal perspective and a Chinese travel log where people can peer in and see what it's like to travel around China and meet people locally and work and live in that environment, you know? So it's not like your typical story of uh, supernatural or paranormal tales where someone just tells a ghost story. It's all woven into a larger context of a person's life and why they see it that way or why they don't dismiss it so easily or, you know, things like that. And, you know, even when I talk about the giant monkey of Wu Tong Shan, um, I, I talk about an experience I had when I was like four years old with my cousin Tony, where we saw some kind of mysterious primate in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., you know, and when we ran up to see what it was, the thing had vanished. And so then you see something strange later in your life. You have this memory to call on that you don't always see normal and ordinary things, you know, and maybe you can't explain what they are, but you're not going to throw it away as a uh, optical illusion or play of light because strange things happen in this universe, you know, and just not being able to explain them doesn't mean they're not real. Exactly. So uh, yes, that's what does. China Weird is about. So it's that, that's kind of a multi-layered book. Yeah, and no, people can good. go back. You can go to grammarica.ca slash ep217, and that'll pop up our first interview with Carl, which we talk all about that fun stuff. Yeah. So uh, there's some pretty smoking hot pictures of the Tencent girls in Chapter 9, if you want to see that. What? I don't, remember, kind of, I don't remember that part. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Just Grant's book just automatically opens to that page. You just set it down and bloop. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because uh, I think Bloomberg News just did an article on that uh, a few weeks ago. It was after I returned to the States from China. And this guy named uh, Balding on Twitter, who's like a visiting foreign professor over there, been there for years, also in Shenzhen, same as me. He uh, posted that article and made made some comment about it. And then, uh, you know, I replied that, hey, you know, I, I was talking about this already last year in, in China Weird, Chapter 9, and put a link on Amazon. And he says, okay, now I know your book is true. I have to buy a copy. And then, like, the next day I check Amazon and somebody's bought a copy. So thank you, Balding, for living up to your word and buying China Weird. I hope you enjoyed the read. <laughs> Yeah, everyone should head over and buy a couple books. Buy this buy this book for sure because you're really going to like it. And it's kind of like a little piece of Grammarica memorabilia too. That's right. Yeah. It yeah, is. The they're, they're both very enjoyable reads. I mean, China Weird has five full stars on Amazon out of six reviews. So, you know, the people who have bought it have really liked it. Absolutely. I don't blame them. And this one, they'll enjoy this one too, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, is there anything else you guys want to cover, or you want to? Are they gonna? Is China gonna take over the world? Do we have to worry about that? Can I play Thorny in the no. movie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't think China's gonna take over the world. They have a lot of problems that don't make it into the press. Um, in fact, if you guys are interested in that, you might want to follow Balding's world on. Uh, on Twitter, because I think he's one of the few lucid people who talks about what's really going on in China politically and economically. He's got a very good handle on it. That's good to so, know. Uh, yeah, you hear different uh, different narrative from everywhere else. Yeah, yeah. 
You know, it's usually the, the more popular an idea is, the greater chance there is, there is of it being wrong, I think. <laughs> Probably, yeah, exactly. You know? You know, there's one thing my father taught me when I was very young is that most people are stupid. So you never want to be like most people, you know? So that's what makes America special, right? That's right. Most people don't listen to it. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Most, 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 <laughs> most people, and even less, yeah. even less support. But so, that's okay. Oh yeah, well, we should. Up already tonight, though. We should mention oh, yeah. that. Is, is it? Is it like? Is, is there movie? Uh, movie potential for this? And did, will Darren get a cameo oh, as a little oh, native geez, native I tracker? All about that. I yeah, I forgot all about that. You know, uh, I had a mutual friend in Shenzhen. Have a mutual friend in Shenzhen, uh, John Nara who did the, the final cover design of both books. And it turns out um, he has a, a friend in Hollywood who's like a big-time script writer. Um, I can only remember his first name right now. It's Ray or Reynaldo. And he did some, some big Hollywood movies. I think Stand By Me was one of them and a couple others. And he promised to review... He's a Death Star Restored for script potential. I have not heard back from him yet. I'm sure it's not at the top of his list. Um, but, uh, yeah, he, he emailed me personally and said he'd be reviewing it. So <clears throat> maybe I should get in touch with him or John and see if there's any progress on that front. Because the book, I, I think, would make a better movie than a book because the book is mostly dialogue. It's practically written already, right? That's right. And yeah, Graham could be a Nazi. Kind of a... <laughs> I'll, I'll be one of the too, I'll be one of the deep state Nazis, and you can be gets... one of the trackers. Yeah, concentric green just one in the background. I don't want any lines yeah. because I'll just fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you better follow up with those guys, and hopefully they don't steal your idea. Because I mean, we had a guy on once, and and his idea was stolen to make the show OA. Oh, that's right. And that, yeah, that really? was pretty, yeah, that was pretty mind blowing. And he's like, well, actually these guys from Hollywood did come by and I never heard back from him. Meanwhile, a fucking super popular show comes out on Netflix about his work. Well, I don't think that's going to happen because this Ray guy and I, we have a mutual friend in John and, and John is really batched for his character. He said he's one of the really decent people in, in Hollywood. And, uh, he had one of his, I, this is, I, I can't prove this, so I'm just going to say it's a rumor that I've heard that Steven Spielberg stole one of his ideas or did something to prevent the release of a movie so that uh, I can't remember if it was E.T. or um, what was the other UFO movie he did? Close Encounters? Yeah, Close Encounters. One of those could come out before Ray's movie, and then it turned out that Ray's movie couldn't come out or something like that. And now, bear in mind, I'm this is all secondhand, so I don't know if it's all really true, but this is what I've been told. And uh, they could have sued uh, Spielberg and probably made a lot of money, but they never did, right? And then years later, they're in a meeting with him, I think, for a script or something. And Spielberg says, why didn't you guys sue me? You know, you would have won and you would have been paid. And they said, you know, we didn't come here to sue people. We came here to make movies. Aww. And Spielberg said, all right, you're, we can work together on the, on, on, on the project. You know, he just respected them so much for that, nice. for showing character, yeah. you know. So with that story to back up his character, I'm not, I'm not worried that Ray would do something like that. Good to know. Yeah, good to know. <clears throat> good to know. Well, right on, man. Thanks for coming back, Carl. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks for the honor of uh, getting right the forward. That was awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. No, I thought you guys would be perfect for it. So, you know, you should pat yourselves on the back for that one. Okay. And it was very well written. Shut very up impressed with, uh, <laughs> with your articulation skills. <laughs> yeah, that's what Bill helps out with some of the articulation we we slap it together. He's our uh, he's our editor. He's our editor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he yeah, ties he it up nicely. He didn't drop a single f bomb in the forward. I think. No, there, well, there was a couple. I think he edited them out. 
<laughs> so shout out to Bill. Yeah. He knows who he is. Yeah, shout, Bill. shout out to Bill. All right. Okay, right on, Carl. Carl. I hope our paths cross again, gentlemen. Yeah, Absolutely. for sure. Let's touch. make sure of it. All right, buddy. If I end up in your neck of the woods, I'll let you know. Yeah, Absolutely. For sure. Okay. All okay. right. Thanks, buddy. So, Ciao. Uh, yeah, you bet. You guys yeah. take care. Okay, you take too. care. Bye-bye. Bye. And that was our chat with Carl Joseph DeMarco. Right on, buddy. That was fun. That was a fun one. Yep. Great book. Highly recommend. Head over to Grandma the link in the show notes. I think it's like three fifty. Funny how the old show starts coming back after we start talking about it. Because I can't remember episodes very well. Hmm. Yeah, but it was a good book. Absolutely. It was awesome. Worth buying. Carl's yeah. always fun to have on. That's my favorite three books from guests. Um the One Great Year, or whatever it's called, from Renee. Sequel's coming out soon. And uh, and Ephraim's book, the blue one, the blue uh, the one about the Alien blue, Cartel. The, yeah, Alien Cartel, and then this guy's. Yeah, it was awesome. Nice. Yeah. There you have it. Buy all those books. Yeah. Yeah, big thanks to Carl for coming on the show. Big thanks to you guys for, for listening. Uh, if you like the shows and the no commercials and all that stuff that we do for free, head over to grandamerica.ca slash support today and sign up for some... Thing. There's weeklies, there's monthlies, there's yearlies, and there's Patreon as well, as well as a few crypto options. Currently, we're not doing Litecoin because I can't figure out the login, but the Bitcoin and Ether or whatever is all Ethereum? working again. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, and I think we'll wrap it up there so Grambo can get to his hockey game. Good yeah, luck. Thanks, buddy. All right, guys. Thanks for <laughs> yeah, listening, and we'll see you next week. 